You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. This week, special guest, former member of the U.S. Navy, and actually very excited as uh, I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, and he is a Georgia native, and so it's good to have one of our own here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. His name is Dusty Kirby. Dusty, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Your story is an incredible one, and for those listening, just some quick background. You know, you were wounded, shot in the face back in 2006, and your entire jaw had to be reconstructed and put back together to give you the life that you currently have now, which is one as close to normal as possible as many of our vets have. But let's start with the main question we always ask everybody, which is, why did you join the military? Why did you join the Navy? Well, I, you know, from a very early age in my life, I always wanted to be a hero and in my mind you know those people that served overseas and you know fought in wars and things like that that's uh that's where heroes are made and you know i I had plans afterwards to join law enforcement or be a firefighter or you know something along those lines but i knew that to get to where i wanted to be uh the military was my first stop so so when did you know it in high school? Is that what you were trying to do in high school? Was all the preparation you did in high school for getting into the military? Uh, I took, uh, when I was in eighth grade, they had, um, they had the Army ROTC program visit us from the high school to right. speak with us and stuff. And as soon as that happened, I was like, that's it, right? So I joined ROTC in ninth grade, and I stayed in ROTC to the end of high school, which you know, when I joined the military, ultimately it got me uh, got me a little bump in rank, uh, put me at an E three joining because I didn't plan on going to college prior to. I, I didn't, you know, no offense to anybody, I didn't want to be an officer. You know, I wanted to be in it, like in it to win it. You know, <laughs> and I did, like I said, I didn't plan on making a career out of the military. I just knew that it was part of my plan. So you graduate high school. It's like the next day you walk into the recruiter office and sign papers. Is that did it happen that quickly? Well, um, before I'd actually graduated high okay. school, I I was in uh, I was in negotiations with the army, right? And you know, then September 11th happened, right? right. And everybody was kind of you know bumping everything up, and because they were bumping everything up, my contract with the army was you know found in conflict because you know everybody was getting shipped out, and what I'd originally wanted to do in the army, which was, uh, you know, airborne MP kind of stuff. Right. Right. And utilize, you know, being a police officer. Right. So they, uh, they ended up knocking this off my contract, knocking that off my contract. And towards the end, I was just like your basic infantryman. And because they had shifted their focus on me, I felt like, you know, they weren't necessarily concerned about me and me and my recruiter got into a big fuss over it. And I ended up not going with the army. So I took about a year to set everything up and figure out exactly where I wanted to go and exactly what I wanted to do. And during that time, I did a lot of research, and my cousin also decided to join the Navy. Um, he did he did so before I did, and he went looking through all this business, and you know that's when we found out about hospital corpsmen and you know at that point in time, you know it sounded a lot like a nurse you know, as far as the job description goes. But we found out about the uh, the green side of things, which was, you know, the corpsmen that are attached to Marine Corps units who are pretty much Marines and medical personnel. And I figured that, uh, you know, I was told it was a very daunting task, and I've always been up for daunting tasks. So I undertook that role and mentally prepared myself for that path. You were in high school during 9-11, so you were, what, 17, 18 years old, correct? Yes. I had just become a senior. You're okay. Correct, yes. Let me ask you, when that happened, what were you thinking? I mean, you knew you would want to go into the military, but did any of what happened on 9-11 kind of scare you or deter you and saying, look, this is, uh, got real, real quick? Not at all. Not at all. Like I said, from a very early age, I was mentally prepared to uh, to step into what I called the baptism of fire and 
have all of my weakness burned away so I could stand strong and be the hero that I saw myself in my mind. Let's fast forward to when you get into the Navy. What's your first duty assignment? What are you doing? Where are you? Uh, so I did the nine-week uh, boot camp training, which was pretty much teaching me how to work on a boat, right? Um, I didn't, I'm didn't. i not saying I didn't take it seriously. I'm not saying that it didn't affect me. I'm saying that what I learned there didn't necessarily fit in with what I was going to do. So I uh, kind of went through the motions, you know, went with the flow of things, and I made it. So after that, I went to uh, A school, right, up in Great Lakes, Illinois. Mm-hmm. The um, At the time, they had, that's where the hospital corpsman training was. And I did the 14-week, you know, kind of basic corpsman training, you know, which had to do with working in a the hospital. They talked about field medicine. They talked about this. They talked about that. But I just pretty much I had to learn about, you know, cross-contamination and, you know, sterile procedures and uh, developing sort of like, you know, good habits towards healthcare, right? Um, from there, I went to um, Field Medical Service School, which is now called uh, Field Medical Training Battalion. But uh, I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and FMSS went on down there. So it was another seven weeks of pretty much teaching a sailor how to be a Marine. Okay. Right? With some field medicine laid in there, right? And after that, I was taken to 8th Regiment to await my battalion that I had chosen, like I said, before I ever even left MEPS. I, uh, I had chosen 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, because they were called America's Battalion. Wow. You know? And uh, they had gone on several successful combat engagements at the time, and uh, their, their deployment had been extended a month, Right which is why I showed up a month early because I was supposed to show up right when they got there. So, um, but I, I hung out at 8th Regiment for a little bit helping out there, and then I got picked up by 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines. What year was this? And, uh, 2003. Okay. And once I got picked up by them, I never looked back. All right, and so your first deployment ends when? Uh, August of 2005. Okay, so August of 2005, you get your first deployment, you come back home, right? You come back stateside at least, or do you stay, you know, in a forward area? Well, no, we came back, okay, right? Because it was a, the, the primary thing was like the Navy, you know, when they deploy, they, they deploy for six months even, okay. mm-hmm. you know, and unless they're extended, they come back because their ships need maintenance and things like that. And, uh, you know, they were taken back to Norfolk, Virginia, and we were dropped off in Camp Lejeune. Okay. So, and we, we took a week off. Right, had our post deployment leave, and immediately after that, we began our workup for uh, what I like to call a real deployment. And <laughs> why is it a real uh, deployment? <laughs> well, because we were we were going somewhere where stuff was happening, <laughs> you know. And um, I mean, that's just the way it is for like boots on the ground. You know, we we're not privy to you know the higher machinations of things. We're you know we're just engaged in what's happening right there in front of us. So, you know, hence why we need direction and things like that. But um, after that, I was taken from headquarters and service company, and I was transferred to weapons company, where I became a line corpsman, which is, you know, just something I really wanted to do from the get-go. And, you know, because those are the guys out on the line, you know what I mean? Right. Rather than sitting there waiting for stuff to happen, I'd already be there when stuff was going on, you know? And I felt like I would be able to do more good on the line. All right, so when you get back to the Middle East for your second deployment, where are you? Uh, and you you're actually stationed in a, in a place in Iraq, correct? Yes. We were, um, well, we came into Camp Fallujah, right? Mm-hmm. And we were based out of Camp Fallujah, but we did most of our operations um, around 45 minutes northwest in a city called Karma. That was uh, Weapons Company's area of operations. And for those listening, Fallujah is probably about uh, 30, 45 minutes, 30, 45 miles directly west of Baghdad. Fallujah, Ramadi, that area. And some of the mm-hmm. most intense fighting in all of Iraq took place 
in those areas. It, you know, and the time that you were there is you you were in the middle of 2006. That was the worst time in Fallujah and Ramadi. As a, as a matter of fact, when the surge happened in 2007, for more background for people, that was where a big chunk of people went because the violence was at its height in that area, in the Fallujah, Ramadi area. Okay, so when it, when in 2006 do you get to Camp Fallujah? July 25th of 2006. All right, so you're on a six-month deployment. Uh, we were, it was supposed to be seven, slated for seven, right? Uh, with, you know, two weeks of, you know, work up while we're over there and two weeks of turnover while we're there. Okay, well, so. and I, I bring that up specifically for a timeline for later on, obviously, mm-hmm. to talk about your particular instance. But so you get there at the end of July and slated to leave sometime in January in that time frame. Now, with that, what's going on when you get there? What are you seeing? What's around you? I mean, how is the, the action and the tempo? Well, there was a, uh, like, four days before we got there, something to that effect. It, it may be more, maybe less. Uh, you have to forgive me. My memory is a little hazy. But uh, during their last, like, weeks there, uh, they ended up losing a Marine to sniper fire. And, uh, you know, you forgive me also, I, I don't remember the unit that relieved us or that we relieved, but they were, uh, they were East Coast, uh, West Coast, I'm sorry. And <clears throat> when we got there, they were, they were still in the throes of losing somebody so close to the end of their deployment. So when we got there, quite literally, uh, my turnover was, you know, have at least four body bags on your truck because you're going to need them. Wow. You know, was it, and uh, when you hear that, is that like a sombering thought? Like, what's your reaction when you first heard that? Well, you know, uh, you you look around and you're like, OK, so statistically speaking, you know, I'm not going to be talking to some of these guys by the end of this. And it uh, I would say that it, uh, you know, you said somber, but. You know, my my pride in myself and in my work um, kind of pushed me in the other direction where I was like, you know, I'm not going to let that happen. So when everything starts, you get yourself planted on ground, you get used to life there in, in Fallujah. Take me through kind of a normal day. Uh, well, the first week was relatively normal. There were a couple of mortar drops on Fallujah, but they didn't impact anywhere near where we were. And it was one of those things like, you know, you hear the siren, you go to the bunkers, right? Uh, which were just concrete boxes out there, right? So, uh, we did our, you know, all the, all the upper echelon of people got their plans, got their battle readiness going. Uh, we got our turnovers, you know, um, you know, informing us of the area where we were going. And we were told flat out that uh, Karma hosted at the time, according to intelligence, 85% of the population in Karma were refugees from Ramadi and Fallujah and Anasaria. Okay. So they, uh, they weren't like civilian refugees. They were like combat refugees that had been pushed from those cities to this place. Riding through the area, it was it was literally like a wild, wild west, man. We uh, we were out there, and you could feel every single eye on you. It was it was definitely a uh, like a like a hair raising experience. That's when I think that's when it really hit me that you know these people are going to try and kill us. All of that came to a head, truly, because you know over time, I mean, things begin to happen, right? You. Sure. You catch an IED and you call EOD to dispose of it, and you feel like you you did something, you averted a danger, you know, or you know you uh, you know get uh, get pot shotted every now and then, right? So it's um, you know they're they're you know you realize that they're testing you, they're they're seeing your responses so that they can better plan for the future. Then things start to happen, right? Like uh, an IED that you didn't see. You know, blows up the first truck in the convoy, and you're just sitting there for a second watching the. You know, I tell you, it was it was the craziest thing ever. The first truck, we went uh, down through this little bottleneck, uh, trying to aid uh, map three because we were map two, and we were trying to aid map three uh, with with uh, fire and support from across a river, and we went to move into a better position, and somehow, you know, the planning on these guys' parts is uh, impeccable. Right, so they just put a bomb down there, 
and uh, pressure plate. And when they went over it, it exploded and blew up the whole front of our first truck. And I'll never forget it. Sitting there, you know, something just happened. That bomb just went off. And I'm watching all this stuff up in the air fall and hit the ground. And, you know, you're not to not to throw it out there. No, put know, it out like there. Because you, you train and you're, you're taught to wait, you know, gauge for a secondary, you know, and you're waiting and right. you're waiting. But as you're, you know, the three seconds turns into three minutes as you're watching this Humvee tire just fall 200 meters, you know. And it hits the ground and it bounces and there's other pieces on the ground and you're sc- scouring these other pieces, seeing if there's, you know, body parts and stuff. You know, and your heart's just racing faster and faster and faster. And then you see a guy pop out. And when you see a guy pop out, he's running around to get to the back. And, you know, it's my job. It's my job, not theirs. It's my job. And, uh, you know, in that moment, you just say, fuck the secondary, you know, and you run up. And when you run up, you know, everybody's kind of okay, you know, and you're just taking people where you can better gauge, right? But then you realize that. You know, you don't even hear the rounds coming at you because you've been engaged, right? And uh, here I am sitting in this parking lot in the back of a highback, uh, open-topped highback, and there are rounds hitting around us, and everybody else is scrambling, and I'm just trying to see how badly hurt my Marines are, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, that was the first day, but, you know, fortunate, fortunately for me, um. Not so fortunate for others, but I, I, I've never lost a Marine that I laid hands on. So that's awesome. Um, it was, and that that was really put to the test a few times, you know. But I was I was able to pull through it and, you know, do my job. Did you ever right? find it like tough? The first person you worked on that was wounded in combat. Did did you ever? pause for a minute did it ever overwhelm you did it, you what, what are you thinking what are you feeling or you're just not training kicks in and everything else takes over oh no no that came later the uh i was because in my mind i'd gone over scenario after scenario after scenario right uh people say don't overthink it i firmly believe in overthinking because i i put myself in that position so hard that i had already done this a hundred times you know and, uh, you know, it, I, I looked at, you know, I looked at legs and arms and things like that as easy fixes. You know, a bullet hole, a easy fix, you know. Um, you know, treating several people along the way, right, uh, you know, because, I mean, we, we were engaged pretty heavily. Everyone, you know, battalion-wide was engaged pretty heavily. Uh, then August 23rd came. And what happened on August 23rd? <clears throat> Uh, August 23rd, one of my, one of my former Marines, uh, he was with map five. Well, anyway, they were, they were out doing uh census operations and, you know, checking this, checking that, seeing what's going on. And they stopped at the gas station to, uh, you know, um, speak to some people that they had found. And while they were talking to some people that they had found one, you know, my Marine, he was out there and, uh. I mean, bear in mind, he's not my Marine anymore, you know, but he's always my Marine. So he was handing out candy and taking pictures and stuff. And he was, uh, he was shot by a sniper. And, uh, it was, you know, it was, a it was a through and through kill shot. He was, he was dead before his knees hit the ground kind of thing. And, um, you know, that's humbling to me because, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's an injury that, Typically, it's taught, but is beyond fixing, you know. Um, you know, so then, then we lost somebody, and that was uh, that was the first death of our deployment on August twenty third. How did and, you handle uh, it? I uh, I was going over in my mind, going over in my mind, because you know, through through what you're taught, uh, you know, to be to put it bluntly, if you see gray matter, you you make them comfortable and you let them expire. That's the teaching of things because you don't want to waste your materials on somebody who's not going to make it. And uh, the, the you know people don't understand the 
people can imagine, and they see it in movies and video games and stuff, but the reality is that the destructive force of a 7.62 round is beyond our comprehension. You know, when when you see it, you are... I don't know, as, as far as I go, I was, uh, you know, from a professional standpoint, I was amazed at it. I uh, I was just in awe of, you know, what I saw in front of me. Did you and, ever, uh, did you ever in the process of coming upon the wound say, well, I haven't seen this in training? Like, were you shocked at what you had seen because of, you know, the, the, the seriousness of the wounds? And as you said, the... The impact that a seven six two round has, were you unprepared to see a wound? Not in the beginning, no. Like I said, the uh you know, bullet bullet holes in arms and stuff, um you know, stuff you know, I not to not to put it down, but simple simple fixes, easy fixes, because they are. Right? When you when you get in that mindset and you realize that all you have to do is react, they're they're simple fixes. Right? Um so you know, uh, over time, things happen, stuff happens. I actually ran into my my very first, like, what do I do moment? Because, like, like you said, uh, there, there are points in time where you run into things that you hadn't contemplated or hadn't run into, you know, in training or anything like that. That came on the 8th of November. Now, I, I know I'm skipping a whole bunch of days, and there was stuff that happened on other days, but... Uh, the eighth of November was pretty impactful for me. Um, Why? I was actually well. I was actually involved in an IED explosion. Okay. I uh, I was in a truck, uh, the uh, truck five, right? And um, I wasn't supposed to be in that truck. It was just one of those things like our high back was taken, and you know it needed work, and I was just kind of put in the empty seat, and uh, we got blown up. So my gunner in the truck, he took shrapnel to his right butt cheek and his right leg, and um, easy fix. But uh, after I woke up, uh, all I heard was screaming, and there was there was blood all over the windshield. And I was, you know, it was one of those, like, you know, what am I going to see when I open this door? Well, when you say right. woke up, was it the concussion of the explosion that kind of knocked you out yes, momentarily? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And uh, you know, I, I've I've heard that type of thing from uh, from many a warrior, right? You know, you wake up and you check yourself and all that bit. I didn't. I didn't even. I um, like I said, I saw the blood. I heard the screaming, and I knew it was on me to get around the truck. Like, if if my legs were gone, I would have landed flat on my face when I opened that door because I didn't even think about it. All I was thinking was, you know, what am I going to see when I open this door? So when I open the door. The driver, uh, Daniel Nicholson, he was um, he was looking at me, and he had caught a big piece of shrapnel to the face. And, you know, I, I put a bandage on it. I was trying to secure his airway. As long as he could, he could kind of talk, and as long as he could do that, I had him lean forward so that all the blood would uh, pool in front of him and not go down his throat. You know, just training kicks in, but like, you know, like you asked, the, uh, the what do I do moment. That uh, that was one of the things that sticks with me. Right, and forgive me, I'm kind of saving the the big event for uh, right after this before we talk about me because I, I have to talk about that one before we talk about me. Well, so, what's the big event you're referring to? Oh, uh, I I know this happened on this thing, but I'm I'm really trying my best not to not to cry. So, so anyway, we get Nicholson out and we get him on the on the helicopter and he goes off and he he's great now he's doing good. So, but prior to that, you know, the only reason the only reason I was able to you know figure something out right then was because I had already figured that the worst thing that could happen had happened, and it had happened on October thirtieth of two thousand six. Okay. And um, this is uh, oh, it's hard to talk about. But, whew, so we're, we're out, and, um, you know, we're just searching the countryside, you know, just, uh, we had, uh, we had had two reporters, um, attached to our unit so that they could, you know, kind of 
you know, get a front lines experience kind of thing. Okay. And, you know, tell the story from, you know, a boots on the ground perspective. And they were real cool dudes, real cool dudes. I, I still keep in touch with one of them. You know, they were in my truck. So, you know, if, if they got hurt, I was right there. Um, but, you know, we were, we were just doing like some normal stuff, some busy work stuff because they didn't want to put reporters in a dangerous situation. You know what I'm saying? Right. So they, uh, you know, we were just rolling around and after we had cordoned and searched several houses and buildings, took like, you know, a couple of hours, three hours, something to that effect. And, uh. We are getting ready to return to OP Omar, which was our base of operations in the area. In the, area. Um, the front truck had to do, uh, had to do like a backup, right? And they went forward, and the gunner uh, did a, uh, you know, spot check, right? So he jumped up and leaned out, and he's like, yeah, you're good. And I was watching him, you know, and then we heard a gunshot. Right, a single gunshot, one single gunshot. You know, the kind that uh, you know, that echoes in the back of your mind forever. And I'm sitting there waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and uh, I, I didn't think anything had happened. So I was, I was waiting and waiting, and I was gearing down, you know, on the inside, and um, they uh, like called for Corman up, which is uh. You know, that's what the Marines say. You know, the uh, the Army says medic, medic up, yep. however they put it. And, uh, you know, Corman up, that's like the call to action. That's the, uh, you know, that's when I become a different person. You know, and I am, you know, I am there. That's what I'm supposed to do. Well, there were two trucks in between me and truck one, and there was about 30 meters between each truck. So close to 100 meters away was truck one, and they said, Corman up, Corman up, truck one, truck one. And I had my driver try to get around, but we couldn't uh, because it was a narrow stretch, of, narrow stretch of road, right? And finally, I just, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I opened up the door, and I ran. And I ran up, took cover behind the truck, ran up, took cover behind the truck, ran up. And the driver, Colt Peloso, he popped out, and he said, hey, he said it. He said the, uh, the words that I was dreading right and it was uh it's smith he's been shot in the head and um they opened up that door you know and he, he just he looked like a baby you know what i mean mm-hmm. like a like a sleepy little baby and in my mind right i was i was probably there for about three seconds standing still just trying to think about what i was going to do and it's like a it's like a firecracker went off, man. And I uh you know, I dove in and I just started working. And I started working and I didn't stop working until the helo landed and the uh you know, to this day I can't I can't say exactly what I did because I don't know. I don't know looking back on it, I don't know what I imagined, I don't know what I thought about going through. It was a very surreal experience. Um, but somehow, some way, what I did do, uh, contributed ultimately to his survival. Wow. And, uh, me and him, we're, I don't know, man, we're real close now. It's, uh, (laughs) kind of like, it's hard to explain, but I mean. No, it's really not. I mean, I think everybody listening can clearly understand why you'd be close after the fact, but I mean. I mean, before that, he was my roommate. You know, I had I had spent a lot of time talking to him and, you know, getting to know him and, like, simultaneously. I'm not, I don't know, man. It's like, it's like I was just dreading the next three days, sitting there just waiting on them to say that, you know, he had died. You know, he had expired. That's what they call it, expiring. But, um... Well, Dusty, let me ask you real quick, just because you, you work on a, a various number of guys, and some of them you know better than others. Uh, when it comes, when you come up to Smith, and you know that you know him, and he was your roommate, and you've talked to him a lot, how hard is it not to get emotional and get overwhelmed in that spot? Going, oh my God, this is like one of my dearest friends, and I'm watching him die in front of me. Oh, that that wasn't even a thought at the time. At the time, it uh, 
you know, at, at the time it didn't, it, that, that thought didn't even cross my mind. Like I said, the, um, you know, my pride and whatever, whatever you want to call it, I, I kind of pushed all of those negative feelings aside and if I'm focused on what am I going to do, you know, and, uh, it, it didn't hit me until after I put him on that helicopter and I let him go. Did anybody tell you after the fact, any medical professionals tell you what you had done that had saved his life? No. No, it's always been your actions. That's what it says, your actions, multiple. And uh, But you don't remember what your actions is? I, I remember uh, he quit breathing. So I breathed for him um, to get him to open his mouth, right? I uh, I stuck my finger, like you, you never should do this, never ever, right? But I did. I uh, stuck my finger in the back to, you know, see if he had a gag reflex, right? Because if he had a gag reflex, he'd open his mouth. If he had a gag reflex, then there was something to save because he had involuntary function at that point, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so much... There, there's like so much to talk about something that took like one second. Wow. You know? And, uh, you know, when he opened his mouth, I, I gave him two rescue breaths. After that, he was breathing on his own. I, I lightly wrapped his head with a bandage because I wanted to account for, you know, intracranial swelling, you know, save as much as I could, you know, not dig around in there. It, I mean, there, you know, no, no joke. There was a hole there the size of my fist, you wow. know, and I, and I got gorilla hands, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so it was, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't, I could, I could relive that moment a hundred times and I probably wouldn't know what to tell you as far as what I did, but I know that I did stuff and because I did stuff, he's, He's here to talk to me today. Yeah, I mean, I I can't even, you know, I'm just trying to mentally process all this myself right now. And as somebody who's been in combat and seen some of the worst things that ever happened, I mean, even this is, you know, a lot for me to to comprehend. I can only imagine what the listeners are are thinking and feeling. And all of this, as you tell it, um, seems almost, you know, the way you describe it is much bigger than what we're about to talk about next, which was Christmas Day 2006, and what had happened to you. So take me through Christmas Day 2006. Well, uh, it started out like normal days. Um, after I'd gotten blown up, right, They, uh, I didn't want to, but they gave me a week off, right? So I was uh, separated from my platoon, and I didn't like that, not one bit, right? But uh, I had some good people take over while I wasn't there. And they handled business while I wasn't there. And then as soon as I got back, it was like business as usual. But uh, we were we were going around, going around. And, um, you know, jokingly, we talked about, like, the bad luck. You know, yep. bad luck to have Doc Kirby in the truck, you know. <laughs> and uh, to, to overcome the bad luck, we were screaming at the top of our lungs, jingle bells. Right? So, uh we were all having a good time singing Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, right? And uh, that was my trip back, right? So, you know, because Christmas was coming, right? And we uh, we did that again that day because I was put in truck six. And um, I was being taken to OP Omar after uh, staying in Camp Alusia overnight, right? Which was cool because we all got showers and stuff. It was, it was nice. You know, and uh, Christmas Day, it's the same thing everybody thinks, right? You know, as soon as we get there, um, everybody went to the phone center, right, at OP Omar. Yeah. Everybody went to the phone center. And, you know, I called home, and I didn't get my parents. You know, I tried. They uh, they didn't answer. It was early in the morning here, so uh, I'm not faulting them or anything like that. Uh, I was married at the time, and I called her, and I talked to her for a few minutes, and uh, our conversation actually got cut short because we were called to man some posts on top of OP Omar that nobody had ever manned the entire time we'd been there. Really? You know, but, right, but because uh, Ramadan or whatever had just happened, right, and it was, you know, one of our holidays, 
uh, people were expecting a lot of bad stuff to happen. So they wanted to, uh, you know, up the up the force in the area, you know, uh, put more people in more strategic positions. Our platoon was actually split, and uh, we manned every post on Opio Moor, and we actually manned two adjacent posts, posts across the road, right, so that we were, you know, on the lookout for anything and everything, right? And um, I got sent up there. Right, so I'm up there for you know going on three hours, right? Going on, it was like two hours and forty five minutes, something like that. And you know, while I was up there, I'd eaten a, I'd eaten an MRE, you know, meatloaf and mashed potatoes. There you go. Right? And uh, you know, I just did the lazy thing and put it all in the bag at the end. You know, got it all hot and put it all in the bag, mixed it all together. Right, sitting on a broken air conditioner. Just eating my meatloaf and mashed, uh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, right? So uh, my buddy, uh, uh, another corpsman, came up, and he was just talking to us, you know, going around, seeing if everybody was okay. And uh, I sent him downstairs to get me a rippet, right? And, um, you know, he went, and he was going to get me a rippet. And then our release came, right? So I figured I would just, you know, meet. Uh, my corpsman buddy going down the stairs, grab my rippet, and go chill out and make my phone call. And real quick, right? by the way, the rippet is just, it's like a, a a Red Bull, just in case anybody was wondering. Yeah, you know, just yeah, just sorry, not knowing. Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, and the weirdest thing happened. Right, the strangest thing in the world happened. I took one step outside of the post, and everything went white. Right, and um. You know, I, I shook my head because there was a ringing in my ear. I shook my head, and I looked around, and as soon as everything kind of cleared up, I saw my my battle buddy up there on post, right? He was on the ground with his hands folded, covering the back of his head. And I immediately thought that we had been blown up again, right? And uh, so I kind of nudged him with my foot, and I was like, hey, you know, what happened? And because my ears were ringing... At least I thought that's why, but I sounded funny, right? Like to myself, I sounded funny. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to puzzle out why I sounded weird, what had just happened, all this mess. And uh, he looks up at me, and clear as day, he says, you know, holy shit, you're bleeding. What do I do? Right? Okay. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, I'm bleeding. So this is the first time that I check myself and I look down, starting at my feet, going up my legs, looking at my chest, looking at my hands, and as I hold my hands out in front of me to look, blood, like three drops of blood hit my hand. And then after that, it's like the most torrentious waterfall of blood that you've ever seen. Like, in my mind, it looked like The Shining when those doors opened up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Good and I immediately, Yeah, I immediately took a knee. And then I'm, you know, I take my glove off and I'm touching my face and I'm touching my face. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> you know, something has happened. And uh, namely because I couldn't feel my jaw. Right? So that was a moment. Right. And uh, then the calls went out. Everything was going on. And I was taking off my helmet and then I couldn't breathe. So I took off my flak jacket. So I'm leaning forward and I'm looking at the ground and there's all this stuff on the ground. Right. All this stuff. And uh, call it shot, call it adrenaline, call it whatever you want. I just started pulling this stuff together, kind of like piling it up like broken glass pieces. Mm hmm. And uh, I get it all together, and there is a small mountain. I call it a mountain because, I mean, that's what it was. A a, uh, a small pile of swollen flesh and blood, right? And in the middle of it, I just reached out and picked up this thing, and it was a, it was a tooth with part of my jaw. Oh. Right? And I looked at it, and by that point in time, the other people had gotten in there, and they saw me holding that. And I just looked at them, and then I showed them the tooth. And, you know, no kidding, this is what they said. They said, I said, Kirby, I'm so sorry. You know? And I'm like, what does that even mean? 
<laughs> you know? But uh, immediately following that, they wanted all my serialized gear. You know? So I'm taking account of my night vision goggles. I'm taking account of my rifle. I'm taking account of my pistol. You know? Uh, anything I had on me that was serialized, I just hand to them. Right? And At any point in time, are you nervous? Are you... Like what? What you you seem to be doing very matter of fact things at this point. You in know, time. I'll, I'll be I'll be a hundred percent honest. I had no idea how gravely I was injured. I uh, in my mind, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt I could walk into the uh, the bathroom trailer that we had, stitch myself up, take a nap, and continue on. You're a sick in person, my huh? mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in my in my mind, that's what I knew. You you, right? you you operate different than most people, Dusty. That's for darn sure. Uh, well, <laughs> like I said, call it adrenaline, call it shock, call it whatever. I had I had no idea to the extent of how badly I was wounded. I mean, did, like you and, you had been shot in the face. You, you didn't even get knocked over. Did you fall to the ground? No, no. Well, I from what I hear, I stumbled back and caught my like my back caught on the door. And that was where I regained consciousness and shook my head. Okay. Right? So I, I like, stumbled back towards the post, and my flak jacket hit, like, a ledge or something. Gotcha. And okay. I was kind of just, like, I was kind of just, like, leaning. And then I was like, oh, wait, what happened? Right? Um, but anyway, they, uh, you know, they take my gear. They're wanting to do this, that, and whatever else. They say they can't do what they need to do in this post and that we need to get off the roof. Right. So as soon as they say we need to get off the roof, I don't even think twice about it. I stand up, you know, with uh, we were wearing flak suits at the time. I just had it tied tied around my waist. I wasn't wearing a flak jacket, no helmet, nothing. And I just walked out. And, uh, you know, I'd just gotten shot out there. Right. And somebody said something. And I remember thinking, what's he going to do? Shoot me again? <laughs> you know? And, um, and anyway, so I, I walked to the stairs, and when I walked to the stairs, I realized that there were six people in full flak and Kevlar, right? And their weapons were slung at their backs. And I was like, these guys were supposed to carry me down, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just walking, and I'm looking at them, and, uh, you know, we country boys, we just throw up our two fingers to say, hey, you know? So I did the country boy wave to everybody on the way down, and I just watched every single one of them, the color just leave every bit of face they had. And uh, that's when I got to thinking. I was like, this might be pretty bad. Got to the bottom of the stairs. I kicked open the COC, and I did my best to say uh, Merry and Christmas, right, to uh, Staff Sergeant Lavador, who was on the comms at the time. But uh, I don't think anything came out. I'm not sure, though. So anyway, I walked past the, uh, the COC, uh, walked past the planning room, and I walked into the BAS, and I started gathering things I needed to give myself an IV. And real quick for everybody, just the COC is the is the operations center and the BAS, the battalion aid station, just so people understand what the what the acronyms are. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, so I walked into the BAS and I sat down and uh, there was a box, right? Like, a, you know, you, the, bottle, the water, uh, the bottles of water come in boxes over there. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the box came over, right? I, I grabbed the box and I took it over, dumped the water out. Uh, and I was kind of like using it like a garbage can to kind of catch all the stuff coming out of my face. And uh, I remember there being a lot of blood in the post. And there was a lot of blood in this box. So I needed an IV real quick. And then my fingers stopped working good, right? So I had a fellow corpsman give me an IV, and he kept saying that I needed a, uh, a crike, which is like a sort of like a trach, right? Um, but it's like an emergency procedure that people, you know, shove a tube in your throat so you can breathe so your airway's not compromised. Yeah. But uh, but my airway wasn't compromised as long as I was leaning over, right? And uh, I remembered that from when Nicholson had gotten hurt, right? So here I am, leaned over this box, and people are asking me questions, and they're talking, and stuff started sounding kind of like, like, wah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, uh-oh something's about to happen here we go right so i take my sharpie out of my pistol holster and i start writing messages on torn off leaflets from this box and uh one of them i presented to my gunnery sergeant my platoon leader and my company commander 
and I apologize for, uh, you know, for getting hurt and not being able to finish with them, you know. And they looked at me, and they were like, you know, what's this kid doing, you know. And sure. uh, then I tore another one off, and, you know, at the time, like I said, at the time I had a wife, so I tore one off, and I handed it to my friend, and I wrote on it, you know, tell my wife I love her, and I'm going to be okay. Right? Right. And uh, it was at that point in time where um, my platoon sergeant, he came up and he said, Doc, the helicopter's on its way. Do you need a stretcher? And I already had one laid out waiting on me. Right? And I looked him right in the eye. Right? And this is when everything kind of came into place for me because I knew I'd lost a lot of blood. I knew that things were bad. I knew that this was this might very well be the last time that my Marines see me, you know, but I didn't want it to feel like that. So I looked him right in the face and I wrote a quick message on a piece of cardboard that said, I ain't no bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I smacked it on his chest and I got up and I walked outside. That is awesome. And, uh, and I waited and the helicopter landed and I was, escorted out to the helicopter and then i gave everybody the finger as i was walking onto the bird that's unreal that's just it's an incredible uh just unbelievable kind of sequence of events that went on um and so all right uh, and uh and then after that right uh it was a long helicopter flight i was going right to alt cotton air station and uh that was the first stop before balad and then after balad you were going to germany Right. right? Mm-hmm. So I roll up, well, kind of fly in on uh, all the and I have I have video footage of this somewhere. They were uh, they were having their Christmas party at the BAS over there. A bunch of corpsmen were having a Christmas party and uh, I kind of crashed their Christmas party, you know, being a corpsman that they gotten shot in the face on Christmas. So uh, they had like I got there and I walked off the helicopter and I was like, where do I need to go? You know, that, that's all I'm thinking. Where do I need to go? Everybody's just looking at me in shock. And two people had a body bag. And I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, what does that even mean? <laughs> so they uh, they had me sit on the back of a Polaris, like a, a gator, right? And um, I sat on that gator and went like 30 feet to, I could have walked it. I don't, I mean, I... I just hopped on it because I was told to, you know. But, it's a four uh, by four, I by got the way. There. Say again? Yeah, it's a four, four by, by four. four, yeah. And yeah, and uh, and we got up to the door, which is literally like thirty feet. And after that, I I got off and I pushed open the door and I walked in and I looked at the guy behind the counter, right? Like, do I need to sign something and check in? And uh, then they pushed me into the emergency area. And when they pushed me into the emergency area. Uh, that's when I had started stripping down and they were going to do whatever they could to stop the bleeding. Then they, they put me out. And when they put me out, it was kind of like sinking into some black water. It was really weird. But then come to find out afterwards, right afterwards, that uh, they actually had been holding a conference for uh, military surgeons. And they had some of the foremost authorities in dental procedures and uh, maxillofacial procedures and small vessel operations in all to caught them the day that I got shot. Wow. How fortuitous. So, yeah. So they, uh, you know, starting from the very beginning, I had the world's best. And then I woke up in uh, Germany, didn't even see the lot, woke up in Germany. That was when I was able to make some phone calls home. Were you able to talk and, at uh, this point in time? No. Okay. No, I had to have I had to have people read what I was saying. Well, what I was writing down and people read it for me. But there was some stuff, man. It, it it's very complicated to talk that way. Especially when, with like When did you find out the extent of your damage when you wake up in Germany? Yes, when I woke up in Germany. What did they tell they, you? Uh, they didn't tell me anything. They uh they told me that I'd been shot in the face. That was it. But that, right? you had but known like, this by this point in time. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that's all they told me. Okay. Right? So 
so anyway, after the doctor left, there was a uh, there was a marine like correspondent there, and um, I looked over and I saw the small shaving mirror that was attached to the uh, you know the little wheel up table thing. Yeah, and um, I was reaching for it, and these uh, the lance corporal that was there was going to help me get it, and the staff sergeant that was there was like, I wouldn't do that. So then they went back and forth. I mean, it was like that scene from Batman where he's like, give me the mirror, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I just wanted to see. And, um, that's what Lance Corporal said. He's like, he just wants to see. So he helped me wheel it over against the staff sergeant's wishes. And I looked at it and that was when I kind of gauged the extent of everything because I, I didn't even recognize myself. Wow. So after that, I was like, oh, goodness, this is going to be a uh, this is going to be a trip here. Yeah. So I'm in Germany for a couple of days and then I got on, I got put on a plane. Right. And I was flown across the ocean to uh, what you call it, uh, Bethesda, Bethesda, Maryland. And I was met by my family. And. Uh, so my mom, my dad, and my wife at the time, they all met me up there. And um, my wife, she gave me a kiss, even on that busted, messed up mug. You know, and it was uh, it was real important. Kind of a kind of a real, real cool thing, you know. And um, one of the most unexpected things was uh, Nicholson, the Marine that I had helped in that IED explosion. He was there. So he came to visit. Oh, that was nice. And uh, Colin Smith, my uh, the friend that got shot in the head, uh -huh. he um, his uncle was there to welcome me, which was really cool. And uh, shortly after that, Bob, uh, Colin's dad, he he came to visit too. Amazing. So it was uh, the session was a real cool place. I was there for quite a while, but uh, how long? So let's see. I got there. December 29th, I had my actual procedure to, uh, you know, kind of rebuild stuff and put me back together on the 7th of January. And then I was there until, I believe, the 8th of February, 2007. But I was, I was hell-bent on getting out of there and being in Camp Lejeune when my Marines came home on the 12th. So... I made it there, and I was actually there ready to help everybody unload their bags as they got off the buses. So it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. Well, again, I, I remind everybody that you, know, you got on this deployment at the end of July, and you came home, your unit came home the second week in February. So you know, all of this was within five weeks of you returning home. Yeah, I got, I got cut short. So, uh, but... I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't look at that as, you know, neither here nor there. I I wish I'd been able to finish it out. But, you know, in, in my younger days of this injury, I wanted to go back. But uh, now I realize that, you know, that's not my place anymore. Right. All right. So let's do this. It's 2007. Uh, you have to suffer through almost a decade of just going through rehab and things of that nature until all of a sudden the opportunity comes to get your entire life changed. Explain how that opportunity came about and what was going to happen. Well, that actually started back in 2007. Okay. Right? The, um, uh, during 2007, it was very, you know, abundant. Surgeries were abundant for me. It was, uh, it became like, you know, another Tuesday type of experience. Right? So I, uh, I had a lot of, going in and double-checking things, um, clearing out dead tissue or, you know, um, kind of like stuff that gets added that doesn't take, right? And uh, it was just a whole lot of, you know, put something in there, clean it up, put something in there, clean it up, take this out because it didn't really work the first time, try again kind of stuff. And um, at the time, we just, we hadn't dealt with that type of stuff yet. Because typically speaking, when stuff like this happened, you know, you were dead. You know, it all went the way it did. But uh, 
sometime, I can't remember exactly when, but I was invited up to New York, and I went up there, and we went to some, it's a, the Marine Corps Law Enforcement Foundation, they uh, they held this gala, and we went up there, you know, the, uh, the CMC, Commandant of the Marine Corps, the uh, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, uh, General Pace was there at the time, just kind of, you know, rubbing elbows with a whole lot of people. You know, we were up there and we were hanging out and chilling out, and there were these two doctors that were part of the foundation. And they were there, and they were like, you know, we heard about what you did, we heard about what you've been through, and we want you to know that whatever the military doesn't finish, we will finish for you. Oh free God. of charge. Pro wow. bono, all kinds of good stuff. And at the time, I mean, don't don't get me wrong. At the time, I had a whole lot of nice people say some really nice things. But... I, I never really followed up. I uh, I didn't keep in contact. I didn't. It wasn't like uh, you know every six months I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. That didn't happen. I had I had total faith that the military was going to do the very best they could. So eventually, my six year term of service was extended. You know, by being put on a uh, limited duty, and they were just kind of trying to find things for me to do around Camp Lejeune. Uh, ultimately. I ended up uh, being put as, like, you know, an extra body out at uh, the School of Infantry on Camp Geiger. So just helping out with whatever they needed, wherever they needed it, right? Doing my best here and there. Towards the end of, you know, some craziness, though, stuff started getting real sour, and the surgeries became less and less. And eventually I went, like, a whole year without having a procedure done. And then I was let go because I wasn't going to be able to get off of limited duty. So uh, the military put me on the med board, and I was medically separated uh, from the Navy. Well, this is when things got real bad, right? Because then I'm I'm working through the VA, you know, and I'm yeah. I'm waiting. I get I get told that when I get out, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna have all this money. I'm gonna be okay. I'm not gonna have to worry about anything. Well, two months go by without any kind of income. Well, I'm, the meager support I got as, like, you know, finishing things out, it, you know, stuff that's supposed to carry you through, like, a couple of months, right? You know, you're used to making, you know, as an E5, you know, with BAH, you end up making a good chunk of money. And, you know, you, for, you forge your lifestyle according to that. And uh, then you get out and you're only making $1,500, you know. It had been a long time since I had to decide what bills I was going to pay and what bills I was going to let go. And I was staying on my parents' couch. Stuff wasn't going very well. I feel like this is going to be kind of heavy to talk about, but it's a, it's a chapter in my story that needs to be talked about. Does that make sense? Sure. So any which way, I, I had a point in time where I felt like I didn't have any support. I felt like there was nothing going good. I felt like I wasn't what I used to be, so what's the point? And at that point in time, a whole bunch of my Marines had uh, had killed themselves by then. So, uh, you know, suicide rates rising and this, that, whatever else. I really felt very alone. And uh, I hit a point where it was, you know, just one of those straw that breaks the camel's back kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I tried to kill myself. So I... um. I hit a point, right? Because up until this point, I hadn't gone, I, I had kind of given up on therapy. I quit taking medications prescribed by the VA and the DOD. I, uh, I'd even stopped taking pain pills, you know, because I didn't want to do anything like that. And uh, so anyway, which way, I drove my truck going really, really fast, like, you know, topping out at 120 miles an hour uh, off of a small cliff into, the, into a tree line, thinking it was going to do the job. And, uh, fortunately for me and my family, it didn't, but, you know, it put me in a position to where I was actually ordered by the courts to attend regular therapy. And because I was ordered by the courts to attend regular therapy, I kind of put myself out there to take regular therapy. And by like the fourth visit out of 30, I really kind of started giving into it and I was able to work with those therapists and kind of figure myself out. And, 
you know, needless to say, I'm much better now than I was back then. Well, thankfully. So, yeah. So, you know, here we are. Well, a little bit of time went by, and I just kind of, I've been taught by the therapist to, you know, accept my situation, right? Because if you fight against it, it's just going to cause hardship. So here I am, 2014, it's going on. And I'm looking around, and I've got a problem. One of my teeth is uh, is infected, right? One of my broken teeth is infected because I was left with uh, broken teeth and busted teeth and misaligned teeth and a broken jaw. And just, you know, just stuff was messed up. So one of my teeth gets infected, and I can see the infection traveling up to my eyeball, oh, right? God. And, you know, me being a corpsman, I recognize this as an emergency situation. And this isn't, this is, this is not a VA bashing thing. So I, I don't want anybody to take it like that because, you know, the VA at the time was overwhelmed with people. So I'm sitting there and I called the VA to schedule an appointment to get my tooth extracted. That's my, that's my entire thought process. And I explained to them that it's an emergency. I needed this, I need this done now. So I'm calling them in February, and they tell me that the earliest appointment they could set up for me was in November. Phew. So after talking to this person and expressing my frustration in the most polite way I could, I uh, told them, thank you for your time, and I hung up the phone. And then I walked into my bathroom at home, and I pulled my own tooth. Oh, you're kidding me. Nope. With a uh, with a Leatherman and a wash rag, oh, I pulled my own tooth. God. Now, it, it, you can say "Oh God" all you want. I'm telling you, it it felt so much better after I got it out of there, <laughs> right? So, so that was cool, right? I was I was like, okay, so I'm missing a tooth. Cool story. And then, um, a couple of days later, because the tooth beside it didn't have the support of that tooth that was there, it actually broke into three different pieces while I was eating. And I had to pull two more pieces out sitting at home by myself because I wasn't going to call the VA and bother with them. Well, then one night my mom and dad came over and I had one of those like real bad moments where I'm just kind of focusing on all the bad stuff. And, you know, they're talking to me and I'm like, you know, I, I feel like my mind is breaking down just like my body is breaking down, you know? And I hit that moment where it's like, you know, it's not going to get any better. It's just going to keep falling apart. And then my mom just out of nowhere says, what about those doctors? I was like, oh, come on, mom. They're just real nice people who said real nice things a long time ago. And uh, she's like, I'm going to reach out to them. I'm like, you do whatever you want to do, man. Right? So my mom, this is uh, March, right? So, this is March time frame after I called the VA in February. And March time frame, my mom calls, uh, emails this doctor. And when she does, he responds in eight minutes with, don't worry, mama, we got this. Wow. Right? That's amazing. And April, they had me fly up to New York and get evaluated for what was going on. And for the first time in 10 years, these doctors looked me right in the face and said, we can fix this. And I was just renewed with this hope, cautious hope for the future, you know. And then uh, I had the first surgery. When I woke up and my everyday bit of pain that I had become so familiar with was gone. And it um, it's hard to explain. You know, like, like picture somebody who blows their knee out, right? It. You know, it hurts when it's going to rain or, you know, you get these, the, you know, my ankle hurts sometimes, you know, when I walk upstairs, you know, you get this daily pain that you expect and that you're, you're, you become very familiar with it and it's your daily pain. Well, mine was in my face, right? So anytime I talked, anytime I ate, anytime I breathed, it hurt. You know, to a level that I was able to live with, but just because I had to live with it. Does that make sense? Yes. So when I woke up from that procedure and this pain that I had come to know so well, 
it wasn't there anymore. And I mean, I've, I've had plenty of surgeries. And I woke up and I, I, I had pain from the surgery, but I knew the difference between that pain and the pain that was always there. Right. And the pain that was always there was gone. Now, that's not to say that I don't get worn out or that, you know, the pain doesn't come back when it's about to rain, but it's not an everyday hate your life kind of pain anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, I told the doctors that, and they're like, oh, we're not done yet. Because I thought that they were just going to fix that and it'd be over. I felt so so much better that I couldn't picture it getting better than what it was. So then the next time I went up, it started the process for uh, dental implants, which would give me a full set of functioning teeth. That would allow me to eat better, allow me to talk better, and just in general improve my quality of life. And I, I, I just couldn't imagine it, you know. And then we're sitting there, and uh, we go up there on a Monday. They pull all my teeth, and they, uh, they let that stuff heal up a little bit from Monday to Wednesday. And Wednesday I go in, and they manufacture my smile. Amazing. It was, and it was just the craziest, coolest nicest greatest thing that that i could have ever imagined i mean it, and, it makes me smile when they say manufacture my smile knowing what you've went through like it's just it's heartwarming eh? oh man it's it uh they changed my life for the better and i can't speak words to express it i, I couldn't say thank you a thousand times and even touch the surface of it it um ah a real wonderful group of people. Well, look, I mean, I can't say enough, you know, again, as a, as a fellow brother who puts on a uniform and, and has been through the war literally and back, uh, what you've gone through and what you've done for your fellow Marines and, and fellow soldiers and sailors and everybody, um, you know, it's you've certainly repaid us back uh, and you, you deserve everything that you've gotten to this point. I mean, you know, I, I know you have a, a deep debt of gratitude as you've expressed to me for mm-hmm. the people who have helped put your life back together. But uh, we also have a great debt of gratitude to you for, for what you've done. And, and uh, this is a, you know, we scratch your back, you scratch ours kind of deal as we do in the military yeah. often, but um, mm-hmm. your story is incredible. It's heartwarming. It's touching. And I, I, I thank you for sharing it with us. Oh, no, it's uh all, I mean, it's it's the journey of every veteran in one respect or another, right? It's the uh, the rise, the fall, the figuring stuff out, and the rise again. And I just hope that people who are out there listening to this, if they think for a second that things are too tough to deal with, I just I, I just want to throw it out there: just hold on a little bit longer because there's no telling when it's going to get better but it will, because it always does. A beautiful message, uh, Dusty, and an absolutely incredible story. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for everything that you've done uh, for well, our country. Thank you for your service. Well, I mean, listen, you know, we do this together. Uh, whether you're still in the uniform or not, we're still brothers in arms. And, uh, again, I, I thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It, it's been unreal. Uh, it's been a roller coaster of emotions through this whole entire, you know, process that you and I have been talking. But uh, I'm, I'm so happy that it ends on such a high note for you personally. Oh yeah, no man, I, I couldn't. Like I said, I I can't speak enough to you know how greatly my life has improved over the past decade. Well, Dusty, wonderful things for you in the future. I wish you nothing but the best for you and your family. Thank you for everything and thank you for your time. Oh, thank you for yours. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.